The Anxious Generation by Jonathan Haidt Anxiety and depression are increasing among the rising generation, Generation Z, anyone born after 1995. In this book, Jonathan Haidt makes the case that this is because of the rise of smartphones and social media, and that's why the problem is only getting worse. Usually with books like this, I feel like they were put together to sell books. Like there's a pitch for an interesting idea, and then the author has to come up with a bunch of chapters that kind of make sense and cobble something together so that it hits a certain word count so they can put a nice cover on it and they can mass produce it and send it to the masses. I'm happy to say that with this book, I didn't think that at all. Uh, I think it's because the premise of the book makes some intuitive sense. Like if you spend a good 30 minutes or an hour just on your phone scrolling, you can feel that it makes you less patient, shortens your attention span when you have to adjust back to the real world. And so you can kind of extrapolate that in your mind of how that's affecting a generation that has the scrolling, the instant access constantly with them and the negative effects that could come from that. At the same time, the book is eye-opening because of how much he talks about the stats. Um, there are lots of graphs, lots of figures that he's put together, lots of notes. Um, and it makes a pretty compelling case that the smartphone, social media, uh, these things are contributing to a more depressed and a more anxious uh, generation. So the reason that I thought this book was successful and some of those other books could learn from what Jonathan Haidt did here. Number one, he put into words the exact nature of the problem. He defined it very well and he stuck with that through the book. Number two, he backed up his assertions with lots of data, lots of facts and studies, and he tries to look at other possibilities of explaining the shifts in the data. And number three, he provides uh, simple and actionable solutions from the home, school, and governmental level. So he puts into words the nature of the problem, which is basically that we are too restrictive uh, to children when it comes to the real world, and we're not restrictive enough when it comes to the online world. He brings up the point that in the 80s and 90s, kids were much more likely to roam around, play outside, without the parents knowing exactly where they are. And that's especially true before the 80s. Then with the increased technology and increased capabilities of phones and such, that has become less and less of the case, and it's going even further in that direction. He brings up an interesting point about a uh, eco ecosystem experiment that was done where this group of people had to live in a closed ecosystem uh, for a certain number of months. Anyway, there, are tr there were trees there and uh, the trees were growing, but then they, they stopped growing because they didn't have roots because it was in a closed system that didn't have the wind. It turns out that trees need wind to grow into maturity because they need the resistance so they can build strong roots so that they can stay in place for when they're a full grown tree. And he uses this as an analogy towards our children. If we bring them up in a situation where they're never exposed to any danger, um, then that doesn't prepare them for adulthood. That's actually a, a big problem. This is what we do to our kids when we are constantly over monitoring them and need to know exactly where they are at all times and refuse to allow them any degree of danger. He makes a lot of good points in the book about how kids need to be developing responsibility, making do uh, in the world without mom and dad in the very early stages, uh, preparing them for when they get older and they really need to be without mom and dad. At the same time that parents over monitor their children, they're under monitoring them online. Uh, parents may have this fear that their kid, if they don't know where their child is at, they're gonna be abducted by some windowless van that's just gonna swoop by and take them away. Uh, or something, but uh, the online danger is much more likely, um, statistically, statistically speaking, uh, because they could be talking to someone that the parent doesn't know about, and who knows what the, some stranger's motivations could be. And he also does talk about data, and he shows a lot of graphs. Um, and the data is amazing to me, just the, the clear upper slope of the line of depression, of, of suicide, of anxiety, of uh, various mental health disorders that uh, all start changing around the 2010s. I'm impressed with Jonathan Haidt too for having all of this data readily available. You can go to his sites and look at all of the graphs that he put together on the, the subject and just see for yourself. Um, I think it's compelling. I think it's hard to find another reason that these uh, trends could be going up. He addresses some of these points in the book, uh, but he keeps coming back to his central thesis as the main explanation for why these trends are, are going up. 
Um, he looks at uh, data from around the world, so it's not just a US thing. And he gives reasons for why this isn't just we're diagnosing it more often, but that there are actual behavioral changes uh, happening. I also thought his prescriptions were, were very good. Um, I'm not an expert on the subject, but it seems like pretty common sense to me. To parents, he suggested no smartphones before high school and no social media until 16. He gives a lot of reasons of why that's important. He talks about the importance of having a lot of time uh, for kids to play with other kids their age and like getting together in the community and with other families to make that happen, to organize that. To schools, he suggested there should be no phones in the class whatsoever. You should come in in the morning drop off your phone and then you get it at the end of the day or something like that because you can't just have no phones in the class because then you have them like checking phones between classes and that just is a big disruption. So he, his recommendation is uh, none, uh, which I agree with. He also had some governmental recommendations. Uh, one, the current age of consent online apparently is 13 and he suggests raising that to 16. He may think to even go as high as 18, but he thought 16 is a good reasonable middle measure. So I came away with this book with a couple of determinations. First, I thought his age guidelines for raising kids were very spot on and I want to incorporate a lot of that with my own kids. Uh, second, I liked how he talked about giving kids responsibility. Uh, a lot of these things seem small and so it seems insignificant to make it a point to have a child do this responsible thing. Um, but if, they, if you want your child to be a responsible adult, you have to give them the small steps that gradually accumulate because uh, then it increases their sense of self-worth because they have this a job to do and that's worthwhile. Um, and like you can't give an 18-year-old responsibility that you've been neglecting you know, every day of his life before that. Like it, it has to be a gradual increase. So um, I really like that part of it too. Third, I was determined to be on my phone less because I would hate to think that my, when my kids grow up, they're going to look back and think, oh yeah, dad was on the phone all the time. Uh, like there's just something about that that really bugs me. So I'm determined to not have that be the case. I don't think I'm in danger of that now, but it's scary how things can draw you in if you're not paying attention. So I'm making a specific point to stay as far away from that as possible. The thing about smartphones and the age of information that we live in now is that everything is extremely convenient. You can see any tourist attraction instantly. Like you want to see Machu Picchu, there it is. Great Wall of China, top of Mount Everest, like you can just look and there it is. And it's good to have all this knowledge in a sense so readily available, um, but we're still grappling with the fact that life satisfaction is strongly correlated to effort. There's just no getting around that. Like, let's say you wanted to see Machu Picchu. And so you look at your phone, you see someone else taking a video, there's Machu Picchu, you've seen it. Um, but you don't really, it doesn't, it's not that memorable, like you didn't, you didn't work for it, you just pull out your phone and there it is. So let's say instead of just pulling out your phone and looking at Machu Picchu, you had some helicopter drop you off at the top of Machu Picchu. So you could look around and see all the greenery and all the mountains and that would be beautiful and amazing. Then let's say that you have to walk to the top of Machu Picchu and then look around. Like, obviously, with those three scenarios, the third one is where it's going to be the most awe-inspiring, the most breathtaking, the most satisfying. And it's directly because of the effort that you put into it. We want this satisfaction to be instantly transferable, but it just doesn't work that way. So that's one takeaway I got from the book. It's the effort that makes the experience good and memorable and worthwhile. As technology continues to get better, I think we're going to have a continuing problem with this. And that's just something humanity is going to have to face because technology isn't going to stop. But that's why I'm glad books like this exist to shed some light on the problem. I'm going to give this book five stars.